Over 1,700 new millionaires are created every single day in the U.S. alone, and more than double that across the globe. They're people from all walks of life, most of them people just like you and I. So the big question is this, how are so many people who didn't inherit money or have any special advantages overcoming the odds and becoming millionaires? That's the question, and this show will give you the answers. My name is Jeff Lerner, and welcome to Millionaire Secrets. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Millionaire Secrets. Excited to be back with you uh, for yet another conversation with a smashingly successful human where we will be delving into the true secrets that make him or her, in this case him, tick and expose the true millionaire secrets that drive success in a world where frankly success is uh, not as common as we probably all like it to be and certainly not as easy. So that said, my good friend Brad Gibb. What's going on, Brad? Hey, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Smashingly successful. I'm not sure, but at least at least I, I squeaked my way onto the show. We'll say that. Yeah, no, no. We're expecting a smashing success <laughs> and a smashing debut on Millionaire Secrets and all, all things smashing. Um, actually, it's funny. I had a, uh, a meeting yesterday as an aside with an attorney in the United Kingdom. And because uh, I have some blogger in the UK that wrote a, frankly, pr pretty slanderous article on me trying to poach my internet traffic. So mm -hmm. I had to hire a defamation attorney in the UK so I can go after the guy. But I've noticed the last 24 hours, I've been using like British, British <laughs> Britishisms in my speech because I talked to this guy for like an hour and I'm saying things like smashing. smashing. And, yeah, very much British. You know, it's a, well, let's have a bloody good time and all, it's contagious. It's weird. But um, so anyway, Brad, uh, owner and co-founder of Cashflow Tactics. I, uh, I've also had his partner, Ryan, on the show. And we've, we've had some, some fantastic conversations, but they're a, they're a pretty cool team. Brad comes at it from a very different angle that I really want to uh, get in depth with him about. And I think as, this conversation is especially timely right now. Uh, money in recent times, and I, I, I don't want to date stamp this episode, but money has gone from a challenging conversation in general to a terrifying slash depressing conversation of late for a lot of people because yep. you know we're in like the covid crazy and uh, riots and it's just a crazy time right um so brad's going to give us some sanity and help us through it but also uh, we're going to get into to what's allowed him to be so successful uh in in frankly taking a very alternative path to success in the financial strategy and counseling industry um because you actually come from wall street but that's not really where you made your mark right hundred uh, percent. Yep. No, I, I, I could not have made a mark if I stayed on Wall Street. And that's what we talk about. We, we kind of have our, our tagline is 97% of traditional advice is dangerous, misleading or outright wrong. And when I realized that, that's when I was, I said, okay, wait a minute, I got to leave Wall Street if I want what I say I actually want. And so I've, I've lived both sides of it. I've seen both elements of that. Um, and that's, that's frankly why I only do alternative things. Because uh, the, the phrase is so true. If you, if you want what everyone else has, do what everyone else does, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, sick, true success is, is rare and it's difficult, which means we've got to find, by definition, we have to follow the alternative path if we want something different. Yeah, I love um, to kind of riff on that point. And I want to talk more about the Wall Street, you know, mm -hmm. every, what you learned there what you love, what you didn't love, what brought you here, what you've learned different, all, you know, I want to dive on that. But have you read the book Zero to One by Peter Thiel? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. when he talks about create, you know, trying to quote duplicate a Mark Zuckerberg or a Steve Jobs or whatever, that the last thing you want to do is actually try to duplicate them. Because creation, creating, you know, and, and he's specifically talking in a startup context, but I, I'm, I, I really don't see a lot. I'm, I live on a continuum, not a, not a dichotomy between life and business. Yep. And I think that's how at least the entrepreneurial spirit is. But in general, I mean, 
you got to have money to pay for your life. So I don't really differentiate that much. Um, the, the, in, in that broader sense, like you can't, there's actually no formula to create your life and right. you're mistaken. And actually the copycat mindset, it, you know, everybody says, well, find a mentor and copy the mentor, but you're meant to copy how, not copy what. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like an old Xerox machine, right? The more times you photocopy something, the less and less, yeah. the more faded it gets, right? right? If you try to just directly copy it, the reason why you get a mentor I don't know if we want to riff on this, but we're going to anyway. The reason why you get a mentor is to learn. There may not be a specific formula that it's going to go in the exact same order, the exact same way, because so much of our anybody's success is not just a product of hard work and what they did. It's some of its timing, some of its fortuitous, some of its luck. There's, there's those too many of those elements mixed in. But what you get close to a mentor for is for the framework they followed mm -hmm. because the framework is something repeatable. If you're going for advice, we say this before, but advice is actually super dangerous, very, very dangerous because it comes from one person's perspective from the one area and the one angle that they, but the one life that they live, right? What's way more powerful than advice is a framework, something that's repeatable that I can look at and see the principles or see a process and say, okay, now I'm going to add my unique ability and my opportunities and my vantage points and my networks into that framework to try to not duplicate what that person has, but create my version of it, my version of success, right? So if you go in looking for advice to say, tell me all the things that I should do, you're giving up your power. You're giving up your control. And that's why it's so risky because it's, it's not on you as to whether it worked. It's on whether they got it right. And I don't want to live my life and have my success dictated on whether someone else got it right for me, right? So I want to learn the framework or the principles that drive it and then learn to apply those. Especially in the context of business, like, yeah. you got to real, because, you know, I mean, people, and I say business, a lot of people may not think, well, they think, well, I'm not a business owner or I'm not an entrepreneur, but actually, and I suspect we're aligned in this way. That's actually a, a flawed thinking. You have to think about your life as a business. You're the CFO of that business. You're responsible for the, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your own life, so to speak. And we, we talk about the same thing inside of investments. Investments is not picking the right things to own that are going to be worth something. It's, it's about building a, a process. It's about building and owning and controlling a system that gets us a result. That's all business is. A family is a business. It's a, it's a series of systems that we operate that get us a result, right? That's all that it is. And the more we can, yeah, learn to, I, 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 what I, I'm in the business owners that I coach, I tell them your job is really simple. It's not easy but it's very, very simple. Your job is to set a target of what you want and then build a system that can deliver on it. That's really it. You have no other job and any other job you have is temporary until somebody else is going to do it for you, but you set the vision and then you build a system that gets you there. And that can apply to money. It can apply to an actual business. It can apply to your personal life. It can apply to your family, whatever that would be is set a vision and then build a system to get you there. So, yeah. And as you're, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, you know, yeah, yeah. I like this. I like this. I, I feel like, you know, we're the, we need to be the CEO. We need to be yes. the CFO. We need to be the COO of our life. And then it's like, yeah. And I think people don't, don't differentiate it in this way. It's like, well, yeah, it's family. So there's also, you need to be like the chief love officer and the chief fun <laughs> officer with your kids or whatever. Uh -huh. But like, it's just like business. Plus there's a little bit extra that's like touchy feely emotional stuff, but it's still like a business. It is. Um, so, okay. Anyway, good. I like that. I, hopefully that's a nice model, a framework, as, as you said, that people can attach to and get excited about and, and probably go home and reevaluate their entire domestic life through a different lens. But talking about these frameworks, you know, wall street has a framework. It's mm -hmm. just a framework that benefits wall street. Yep. So tell me, talk to me about that. What was it? Wh when did you realize and how did you realize that that framework wasn't actually serving people? Oh man, a couple, couple different pieces to it. So my, my background before I went to Wall Street uh, was I, I studied accounting. So I got an undergrad and a master's in accounting. And then, you know, if 
if that wasn't enough, I, I really liked school for some reason. And so I got degrees in economics and statistics as well. And so I could, I could see the, the only way I can describe it is like, it's like I'm in the matrix and I, I, I just see the world through numbers and spreadsheets, right? And, and, and processes and that it makes me not a very good when it comes to feelings or emotional connection near as much, but I, I'm, I'm good on the number side. And so when I started um, on Wall Street, so I graduated, started downtown Wall Street, um, unbeknownst to me, it was a very um, precarious time to start there. It was late 2007, early 2008. Um, and we were headed off a cliff that, of course, me coming out of college, no way could I even have had had a chance to see that. And so where I, I started to learn and understand this was I, I saw it firsthand as we drove the economy off a cliff, right? I watched from the inside how things are created and structured. And then if we go one level further, when I left, I left to start a consulting company where we took companies public. So we, we were the accountants that dealt with the investors and the SEC and got all the books together and took, when we took over two dozen companies through the process of going public. And so I got to see from behind the scenes why investments were being created the way they were and, and how they were being framed up and how they were being sold. And then add to that uh, the other frame of I personally what I wanted. And so I got to sit in a unique place where through the, the 08 crash, so my firm that I was with in 08 um, survived, but next door to us was Lehman Brothers. Hmm. Right. And Lehman Brothers, if you don't remember the story in 08, overnight, they were one of the largest financial institutions in our country and in the world. And overnight, they were bankrupt and out of business. And they were right next to us when that happened. And so walking to work that day, got off the subway, walked out. And there are hundreds of people filing out of the building with cardboard boxes. And so hmm. we spent the next, gosh, probably almost a month just sitting in front of the news wondering, are we going to be the other shoe to drop? Right. And I learned an important lesson there personally that it didn't matter how many degrees I had. It didn't matter that I had one of the best pedigrees now on my resume from the, the investment banking world. I, I looked at, at, at my boss just above me who'd been there two years. He was just as scared as I was. And the guy that had been there five years was just as scared as I was. The guy that had been there 10 years was just as scared as I was. So I realized there is no safety and security in a job or in a resume or in a degree right? We have to be willing to take ownership and responsibility of that. And so, so I left and, and then that's what started me to entrepreneurship. It was like, well, if I'm going to get fired. I may as well just quit and start my own business because I'll never fire myself, right? So that was, that's why I started a business instead was, well, I'm not leaving this to anybody else. I'm going to run my own. But then I realized the second big thing that I, you know, after the work that it takes to launch a company, and if you've not done that, there's a lot of depth there, right? I'm skipping over like years of episodes that we could create on that. But right. what it takes to start a company, and I realized at the end of the day, I was making really good money, but my business owned me. I had, without knowing it, I had created something worse than I had of having a job. I, I created a worse boss than my other boss. I, I, I created a, a business that owned me. And what I wanted more than anything was instead of to own a business, I wanted to own my time. And so with that frame of saying, wait a minute, I want to own my time. And then having the experience and seeing what was built, the investments you're given are not designed to help you own your time. That's not fundamentally how they're put together. They're not created with that outcome. They will make you money. Okay. That's not the question, but for me, that's not good enough right? It's not about just making money. It's about accomplishing the objective because money's not the end game. Money will not solve your problems. Money will not give you what you want. Ultimately, you're the driver inside of your life. And money is a tool that we can use to build the life that we want, right? So if money is the means, not the end, what is the end? Well, for me, it was owning my time. And so then I had to look and say, are the decisions I'm making, are the investments I'm making, are the things I'm participating in even capable of delivering what I actually want? 
And that's why we say 97% of financial advice is dangerous, misleading, or outright wrong, because it was not created with that intent. It was not created to make you financially free. It was created to make you money, but not make you financially free. And there's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, even more well articulated than I was hoping or expecting. So <laughs> thank you. That was, that was tremendous. And so if I'm guessing from the name of your business, <laughs> that maybe the core concept here as far as ownership of time is cash flow. Correct. Right. And net worth is meaningless. Yes. Okay. And, yeah. and traditional financial vehicles are designed to build you to a, a certain, you know, hypothetically sufficient net worth. Yep. It allows you to have a little bit of time at the end when theoretically you actually go convert that net worth into cash flow. Yep. But it's like a deferred strategy. It's like, well, you'll have enough in 40 years that you can create the cash flow. And I assume you guys are like, no, let's create the cash flow now. Now. And, and that's, that's the thing is what we're sold is we're sold rate of return. We're sold net worth. We're sold um, that we're going to make money. But what's left out of that is the, to do that through the vehicles we're given, the one element that is required for it to work, okay, yeah. is the passage of time and a lot of time, right? Think about all those, I'm going to call them stupid books because to me they are, but all those stupid books of like the latte factor, right? Skip your latte, put five yeah. bucks away, and then 40 years from now, you'll be a millionaire. Well, the interesting part about that is that requires, and everybody says this, like compounding interest is the miracle of finance and we should all be, you're either earning it or you're paying it. Well, compound, compound interest are actually your handcuffs preventing you from becoming financially free. Because a picture in your mind for a second, I draw it out here if you're in front of me, but in your mind, picture a compound interest curve, that nice upward sweeping to the right, right? If we drew a line in the middle, which side of that graph, Jeff, do you want to hang out on? Obviously, the, the far right. The right-hand side yeah. of it, right? That's where all the action is happening. But what does it require to happen to get to the right-hand side right. of that graph? Right. Time has to pass. It doesn't matter what we do on the front end of that graph. The result doesn't come until the end. So we're, we're signing up, without being told this, we're signing up for a 40-year game, no matter how well we play it. There's no way to advance it or make it go any faster because nothing happens till we get to the right side of the graph. So we throw out that world and we adopt a world based on cash flow instead about control over our investments. And we look at the world that's actually the same lens that business owners and entrepreneurs look at the world and we invest that way to control time, not compound interest. Yeah. And, and, it feels like a thread is emerging here. A theme is emerging here of looking at life as a business because, you know, for me right now, I'm trying to scale my business and it's like, well, what do I need? I need, you know, a, we need to hire more salespeople. We need to uh, grow our content team. We need to, I, we just added another person in, in support and, and admin. And it's like, well, you have to have cash flow. You have to have free cash flow. That's, discriminatory not discriminatory well that you have this you can discretionary be, discretionary thank you oh my gosh it's one of those days <laughs> discretionary to the freedom to invest and yeah if our business model was okay do what we're doing for 30 years and then we'll have the well essentially we'll have the resources to scale our company we would never get to 30 years from now well, and to bring the analogy back to, to, to your family as a business, if, you're, if your kid who's 10 comes up to you and says, hey, dad, I have a problem, and you say, mom, don't worry, son, we'll deal with it 30 years from now, how's that going to go, right? Yeah. So it, it's, it's about understanding the principles in the here and now to get the result that we want. And, the, and that curve, I mean, Warren, the, I feel like that curve and that whole paradigm is the reason that Warren Buffett's first rule of making money is don't lose money. And his second rule yep. is refer to number one, because that model completely breaks down. If you have even a couple significant setbacks, Yep. you know, yep. little Johnny developed a drug problem. Little Molly got pregnant. Uh, 
my wife Sally died. Like these, you know, I got divorced. Like this stuff happens. This is life. And now the model's just broken. And, and, and it's funny. So again, back to my accounting days, right? Um, I took a whole class on forensic accounting, which teaches you to uncover fraud inside right. of accounting because all, basically all corporate fraud starts in the books, right? It's, it's cooking the books. And so we learned how to discover it. And for me, it was exciting. I loved the class. And uh, when they caught Bernie Madoff, the guy that caught him kept saying over and over and over this phrase of there's no such thing as straight lines in finance. And he's like, if you ever want to catch a fraud, just look for the straight lines. And anyone that's showing straight lines is a fraud. And all you have to do is wait and, and we'll discover it. And so, that, that's, but that's what Wall Street is giving you. They're giving you this nice graph of a nice straight 45 right. degree angle upwards if you just follow all of the things that they do. And they're conveniently forgetting that, wait a minute, life is going to happen. And how does that affect our model? Right. Right. And, and it, it, it for lack of a better way to say it, it's a complete fraud if you're just getting a upward sloping straight line because those don't exist. That's actually really funny that they're actually policing themselves. The SEC and so forth is policing itself by looking for the exact model that they're selling. That they're selling to you on the other On the side. basis of, of the whole system. That's actually pretty crazy. <laughs> I, yep. I actually want to take a beat. Let that sink in, listeners and viewers. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's nuts yep. when you think about it that way. So, yep. so okay. So, you, uh, you do the bold thing, and which is what? Where, where did you go with that realization? So, actually, I, I just had a thought pop in that I want to hit on here yeah. that, that I think will be a natural progression from that. If you say, well, okay, well, where do we go? What do we do? Um, I think the reason why, in, it, <laughs> in addition to what we just said, the other reason why 97% of advice is dangerous misleading or outright wrong is because who we're listening to, right? So let me ask you this way. If you, if you're, if you want marriage advice, are you going to go listen to somebody that's on their third divorce? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, if you uh, want health advice, are you going to go listen to someone who's 300 pounds overweight? Right. But when we go out, ask for money advice, have you ever asked your financial advisor the very, what should be a very simple question of, well, before you give me money advice, are you rich yourself? And if the answer to that is no, well, why would you follow their advice? If they've not been able to follow their advice and get the result that you want, why would you follow their advice? Mm -hmm. Right? It's one of the only industries where this is continued across the board, right? We're listening to other broke people who have just read more books than we have talk about a theory that they've never themselves applied and figured out whether it actually works or not. So it's the definition of the blind leading the blind that we're listening to broke people for money advice. You know, I think you just put a spotlight on probably the great irony and tragedy of our time. And you just helped me. I love these conversations because I, <laughs> I, I just learn about myself through dialogue with, with smart people. I think I just realized why part of why I've always been driven to kind of do what I do of like evangelize and share and seek wisdom. So you're right. The financial industry is largely set up that way. I mean, I think of guys that come knock on, I used to have an office upstairs. So I, I with a, you know, staff of 50 people, in my agency. So it was like a quote, bigger company. So yeah. people see dollar signs and they'd come to the door and be like, I want to talk to the owner and sell them our insurance program or whatever. You like 24 year old kids coming in to pitch me retirement plans and stuff. And yep. it's exactly what you're saying. But, but listen to this. I had a guy yesterday on the show. We recorded an episode with a doctor who's a big leader now. Uh, he's got, you know, a million plus subscribers on YouTube. He's got a big presence, having a big impact, way more than just working as a, as a you know, local doctor um, in, the, in the ketogenic and sort of alternative nutrition movement. And he said, I was 300 pounds. I was sitting there meeting patients every day, telling them to lose weight. And they would just look down at my waistline and, and, and cower because it felt like my button was about to pop and, you know, <laughs> hail them in the forehead. And he said, and yet every time I'd go to the food pyramid and try to do that better, I just got fatter. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, okay, man, so medicine, you know, Western medicine, at least Western nutrition and general yep. wellness theory is pretty unsophisticated. They're very good at intervention, but yes. not at prevention. And then I'm like, okay, well, where else does this go? Our educational system? We're teaching yep. all these kids how to grow up and have prosperity and have thriving careers. And yet, and you know, God bless our teachers. Like, I don't want to be hard on them, but they're not models of economic prosperity. Nope. Or, or frankly, happiness for my, that in a lot of cases. Yep. And like, is, that, is it just me or is actually this kind of how our system, like our, our global society seems to be set up to edify authorities in systems that are actually almost just straight out hypocritical. Almost the exact opposite. Yep. And no more prevalent is it anywhere than in inside of the game of money, right? If you get a degree and you pass a test, you're now qualified to, to, to be the authority on, on money, whether you've made it or not, right? And so my litmus test for anyone that I'm going to listen to for anything is show me your results and would I trade places with you, right? If I wouldn't trade places with you, I'm not gonna listen to you, right? And if you haven't accomplished what, now, I'll let you trade. I don't need to trade places with you for me to rotate my tires, right? Right, right. But, what, but when it comes to a, accomplishing an outcome, especially over a period of time and something that's important, if I'm not willing to trade places with my mentor, right? If they haven't achieved what they're trying to get me to achieve, then they've got no basis to be my mentor. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna follow them, right? It doesn't matter their degree. It doesn't matter their credentials. Like their credentials to me are the results they've been able to produce. But inside the game of money and finance, it's not that. It's do they care? Oh, he's such a nice guy. Or, oh, she just cares about me. She's my neighbor and she wants the best for me, right? None of that matters if they're not capable of getting you what you want. It doesn't matter how nice they are. We want results. And that's what it's about. So... Okay, so at this point, yes, 100%. I feel like there's a fork in the conversation. We could go one way, hmm. try to figure out why the hell the world's just so screwed up <laughs> in general. And I think I'm not going to take us that way because we, we'll do that Smart. some other time Smart. when it's you and me over a steak dinner or something. Yeah, Smart. Um, <laughs> But okay, so you observe what we're saying that, man, this is really screwed up. And first of all, how are you exposed to the, the fundamentals of what you do now and the theories that say, okay, well, here's the alternative. So it, it started me asking that question at the, one of the most prestigious investment banks on the planet and looking around and being like, everyone's broke. What the, like, I, I, no, this doesn't make any sense, right? So none of you guys have the answers. So then that was when the switch flipped in my head. I was going to say, well, I, I don't want to wait till I'm 65 to be, to be wealthy, to, to control and own my time. So I want to find somebody who owns all of their time and is not 65 and ask them what they did. So that's what I spent about five years doing and went from mentor to mentor and guru to guru and book to book and seminar to seminar, trying to distill out. But my statistics and economics brain was not willing to just accept, oh, that's that person did it. I'm just going to follow what they did. I needed a model. I needed a process that I could follow. So I would, I would learn own. I, my, that was my criteria. The person had to accomplish what I wanted and been willing to teach me how to do it. And, and I spent the time documenting what I was learning and putting it into a repeatable framework and, and refining it down to its most basic levels. Right. And I actually remember very specifically, like my biggest aha around this was um, there's, believe it or not, there are, you can get, there are cruises that you can go on that's an investment cruise, right? And so instead of playing shuffleboard up on deck, you're down in the belly of the ship and you're talking investing, like best vacation ever. Right. My wife, for some weird reason, didn't want to come with me. So I went by myself, but we just talked money and investing the whole time. And it was it was this, it was this thing. It was someone would get up and speak about something and they made a million dollars in this. And the next person get up and speak and they made a million dollars in that. And I remember at the end of this conference, the last night as we were like pulling into port, I was pissed off. Cause I was like, what? I'm so confused. Cause all of these people and all of these different ideas, I just like, I don't, I don't know what to do with it. 
And so I sat on the, the balcony of my state road, the room that I had, and it was pitch black in the middle, of like two in the morning, nothing but ocean around me. And I started flipping through my notes. And I'd look at one and I'd kind of reread my notes. And I was like, oh man, that guy, he made a million bucks in single family homes. That's really cool. And flip the page. That guy in Bitcoin made a million dollars. And that guy made a million dollars in, in raw land. And that guy made a million, like all of this stuff. And for the first time, what, what melted away was the vehicle they used, right? And what jumped out at me was it didn't matter what the thing was every single person followed the same process and the same formula. And that's when it clicked that I was like, wait a minute, financial freedom is actually a formula, not the right product, right? It's not following the right steps or doing the exact right thing. It's there, there is a proven formula that these 20 people just gave me. And then I started looking back at all the people that I was studying with. And I actually happened to have a mentor at the time who was worth well over a hundred million dollars. I went and sat with him in his cigar room and, and I showed this formula that I had started to distill and he leaned back in his chair. He owned four or five companies, had millions of dollars of real estate and stepped back and he kind of chuckled to himself. He's like, he's like, I've never put it that clearly, but that's exactly what I did. And more to the point, it's the exact same thing. Every wealthy person I know has done as well. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's what I'm following. And then I didn't do what I was tempted to do. What everybody else is tempted to do is go try to teach it. Cause it was just on paper at that point. Right. right? So myself, and this is when I met Ryan, my business partner. And a little while later, we met Jimmy, our, our third business partner. The three of us took that formula and we implemented it. And for about six, seven years underground by ourselves, the three of us, we implemented, 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 implemented until we became financially free. Then when we were financially free and people started to take notice and say, Brad, like I thought you were at Wall Street and then you, you quit and you did this. I don't even know what you're doing anymore, but how are you buying new cars and going on vacations and doing all this stuff? I was like, well, let me tell you. And so we mentored a few very small, started a very small group of people. We mentored them and got them results. Then once we'd gotten ourselves results and someone else results, then we started saying, Hey, maybe more people should listen to this, right? And we just slowly grew to where now we're mentoring thousands of people through the same process and having them all on the same path. So obviously uh, in, you know, kind of like the starting a business conversation, it's, you gloss over it when you try to <laughs> state it simply or, or, you know, elegantly, the devil's in the details, but uh, is it even productive for me to ask you to, simply articulate the, the base of the formula. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, obviously we had to give it names that don't exist anywhere else because it, no one's, at least to my knowledge, really, really organized it the way that we have. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, for us, it's pretty simple. We call it, there's, there's two lenses that we have to put on. Okay, so again, we have to forget products for a second. And there's two sets of blinders or, or two lenses that we look at the world at and that they're called the core four and the four pillars, okay? And that gives us the mechanism to actually evaluate whether a decision will lead us to financial freedom or just make us money, right? And so inside the core four, the concepts there, that's very conceptual, but we have to start there to understand and not get hoodwinked by the numbers because numbers lie. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest liar of all is ourselves, to ourselves, right? So we can't jump right to the numbers because then we'll just work to believe and justify those. So we start conceptually. Traditional advice is if you want to get a high return, you have to be willing to what? Give it time. Give it time. Yep. But also take high risk, right? High oh, risk, yeah, high return, yeah, yeah, right? That's, that's the trade-off. But we already stated Warren Buffett's rule of never lose money, right. never forget rule number one. So the rich don't follow that rule. So what, that was the first thing that I started to realize. I was like, wait a minute, the, risk, the rich don't take any risk. What's going on here? So instead, they follow these other four principles. They generate returns sufficient to be worth the effort. Rich people don't get out of bed for less than 10%. Like they just don't right. do it. Why? Like it's not worth it, right? There's too many other opportunities. So why mess around with all this low hanging stuff? We don't do that, right? It's gotta be a high enough rate of return. 
Then what they do is they look to understand how much control they have in the investment. And they look to increase their control. This is why if you follow Warren, like there's so many books out there of value investing and follow the Warren Buffett way and we're going to build a portfolio that mirrors, mirrors Warren Buffett. Well, guess what? If you do that, you'll never be a billionaire like Warren Buffett is ever. Because it's just like the copy thing. You can't copy that. It's not what he invested. It's how he participated. He didn't just buy shares of stocks and companies. He bought the entire company. He bought a controlling interest in the company and then affected change right? So they work to increase their control. Then the next thing they do, so that's the two that we increase, increase return, increase control, and we decrease two other things. We work to systematically eliminate and decrease our risk. And we have to be able to know where our risk lies and how to, how to reduce it. And then the second part is the greatest destroyer of wealth is we have to reduce our taxes. We have to invest in a way that we pay less in tax. So increase return, increase control, decrease risk, decrease taxes. That's the core four. And if it doesn't pass that, it will never produce financial freedom for us. This is why I walk away from 401ks. I don't have any control. I cannot manage my risk and I have to pay taxes. I'm out. It doesn't matter what it will do for me or what you can show me on a spreadsheet. I'm out. It's, it's not the, the game the rich play. And so what's interesting about, I mean, a few things jump out at me about that. Increasing control, you know, it's like you say, if, if, you're, in, if you're buying stock in a public company, Unless you're Berkshire Hathaway uh, or Blackstone or something, like you're not getting a, a voice in the nope. operations of that company. So that's out. Yep. I mean, the vast majority of what Americans do with, you know, excess money is out. Um, decreasing risk. I mean, that, that also, for that reason uh, as well, stocks are pretty much out. Yep. The stocks are just, I mean, fundamentally, the biggest driver of stock prices in the short term is like opinion yeah is is opinion politics you know the, the economy and so forth um and most people don't have the staying power to even do value investing in the first place and if you have the staying power you're back in the 40-year game which isn't what we want anyway right, right. right nobody young who owns all of their time did it by buying public companies ever right. and so by the way one other thing that at least as i see it doesn't pass this test and it may not jump out to others. And I don't actually, I'm, actually, this is a question is, am I right in saying this doesn't pass this test? Having a job. So it, it's interesting that fits in a little different place. So let's back out. Let's put four pillars on hold for a second. Okay. And when we talk about money, there's a higher framework that we have to start with, right? Because everybody wants to start with, I have some money, what should I do with it? Or once I have some money, I need to learn what to do with it. And that's the world of investing. But that's only a small part of the entire conversation. Your strategy has to be uniform and integrated across four areas of wealth. Not just growing your money, which is what we think about investing, but it actually starts all the way at the beginning of production. Okay, so there's four areas of wealth. There's produce, protect, then profit, and then prosper, okay? And if we don't understand how our strategy that we're currently following fits in the entire frame, then we'll never, we'll never control our money to the point where we can own our time. So your job is the production element and we need to analyze based on our plan and our situation, are we even producing enough to ever be financially free? And the answer most of the time is it really doesn't matter what you do on the investing side, your limit is your, your ability to produce. And you should go back to your greatest asset and your number one investment, which is in yourself mm. and grow first and make more money. Then let's keep the money that we made. Then we can have a conversation about growing it. But lots of our, uh, lots and lots of people that come into our world that we coach and work with, we get them organized and straight and stop all the bad habits. And the conversation goes back to great. How are you going to go make more money? And instead of giving me money to invest, you should invest in yourself and grow your capacity to earn. Yeah. And I remember Ryan, we, we talked about this as well that, yeah, I mean, for, and, and in our world, in my world, in my education company, we have something that I define as, or what I, what I've labeled as your anomalous cash flow phase, because I have so many people coming into my company who are coming from a job background and I'm, 
I had, now you're giving me different language for it. It's about increasing your production capacity. Yes. But I'm essentially saying whatever, you know, you, none of the rest of this stuff particularly matters if you don't get enough money to actually get ahead, yep. at least for one period of your life. Because yes. most people literally live behind the curve their entire adult life. And, and I'll say something, if we haven't said bold things already, I'm going to say another one. It is just simply too easy to make six figures in this world that if you're not making six figures, everything you should do should be focused on how to make six figures. It's too easy in the world that we live in to not make that amount of money. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I find that it can be grating for people to hear that especially over and over. Um, I've had people get mad at me, mm -hmm. which is odd. I'm like, well, just stop listening. It's the internet. You don't it's like, I'm not in your now. living room. Just right. tune me out. But uh, no, they listen and they get mad. It's like, it's not fair. It's not possible. You don't understand. You've never walked a mile in my shoes. All true things. Yeah. But it's kind of to your point, like between and I'm curious the strategies that you tend to hone in on my, you know, my background, I was a broke, uh, bankrupt jazz piano player who was drowning in business debt. Cause I, I got loans in 2007. I never should have been allowed to get and the restaurants closed. And so, and anyways, and for me, the internet was a very quick way that I could now it wasn't easy. I, I had spent over 10 years developing skills through, numerous fledgling entrepreneurial ventures so that when I, by the time I started applying it to the internet, I had a really good base of skills. I was a better business operator than my results indicated at that point. And finally, I, I did get in the right vehicle and I had a, a big hit. And I mean, life gets a lot easier when you're, you turn your annual income into your monthly income. Yep. It just suddenly it, these it, strategies, it, like, it's fun working. to play Monopoly when you have a big stack of 500s, right? Yep. So, yep. so talk to me what you teach, like what are your sort of recommended vehicles? And I know that you guys don't provide those, but you do kind of steer people, right? Yeah, for sure. Cause like I said, I'm not going to be your, I pay business coaches to help me make money, right? That's right. not where I lead. But what, what we talk about is if you're not making the amount of money in your life, there's three areas to start to look at. Okay. There's three places we can invest. First is your mindset. Are you, are you able to see a possibility big enough? If not, we've got to expand our mindset, right? And you can do the woo-woo side of it. I was never a big woo-woo side of it, but I just need to go hang around people that were doing it until right. I got so mad that I was like, why can that person do it, not me? And my mindset expands, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing is, is you're probably lacking a skill set of some kind. The thing you do is not valuable enough in the world anymore, right? And we, I, I don't want to beat up on teachers, but teachers came up, right? And everybody says, oh, they should be making so much money. Well, no, not really, because we're very good as a society at training somebody that can be a teacher. So right. there's lots of them. And so their marginal benefit is just not that much because it's not that it's not valuable, right? It's we as a society have gotten really good at producing teachers, right? Right. Not, so it has not nothing to do enough. with them. It has everything to do with what we're willing to pay. Right. Okay, so you find a skill set that's valuable, right? Or add to your skill sets that are valuable. So you either might not have something valuable enough to exchange. Or the third part is think about your cell phone, okay? Cell phones are awesome, but what if you were the only one that had one? Would it now be very useful? <laughs> no, right. right? So your network is also very important. So either maybe you have an amazing skill set and you have a big vision, but you're by yourself on an island then you've got to expand your network to be able to exchange, right? So we look at that and we help clients through an analysis. Again, I don't, this is where we can point you where you need to go, but we talk about that. Is it a mindset? Is it a skill set? Or is it a network? Right? Your, your talk about making money on the internet, that's a skill set that needs to be learned, right? We can learn internet marketing. We can learn Facebook ads. We can learn copywriting. We can website building, whatever those would be. Those are skill sets. And if somebody asked me what's probably the fastest way to go from zero to something as a side hustle, it would have something to do with the internet because it's such, it has all of those things in it, right? It's, in, it's a huge network. There's lots of skill sets to be learned. It's incredibly valuable. So that's the lowest hanging fruit 
but I'd say you should probably start thinking about that. But it's one of those three areas that we're lacking. Mindset, skill set, network. And, you know, I, I know a lot of people say, I don't have the money. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're suggesting is that if you don't have the money, it's not that you lack the money, it's that you lack a way to apply your energy to create value to convert your energy into the money. And, and you can't, no one can lean on, I don't have any money because somebody at the beginning of time, some caveman didn't have money either, right? It didn't like, no, there wasn't one person at the beginning of time born with all of the money, right? So everybody had to start from somewhere. And so it can be done, but we have to understand, uh, I look at it as we have two things to exchange. You have money or time. If you don't have money, you have to invest time. If you don't have time, then you better have money to buy the time back so that you can grow one or the other. But everybody that doesn't have money sits and look at the people that are buying their way in and saying, oh, well, that's what I need. But they're forgetting that they have something like they have something the people with money don't have, which is time. So you always have a competitive advantage somewhere and you just need to realize which one you are and, and figure out which one you're going to invest. How much do you guys focus on like, you know, habits, productivity, lifestyle optimization, creating time? Because there are people who say that they have neither money nor time. I uh, know those are just liars yeah. or, dece or they're deceived, right? I mean, I'm just going to say it straight. They just, everybody has the same 24 hours. Now, granted, a single mother of five kids certainly has less time than other people, right? But with the appropriate leverage and the appropriate um, fortitude to get there, I have seen, I have very close friends of mine who are single mothers of lots of kids that still got it done, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it, it is possible um, to, to be able to, to, to do it. Otherwise, I, I don't know what to tell you. If, if that wasn't true, you know, then we're back to a society, like then we're back to a life or a world where I don't have any control and everything I do is chance. So why try it all? Right. Right. Yeah. It's pretty, it's like Calvinism. It's all predestined and there's no, yeah. Point, right. Yeah. And, and, and the, the question I'd like to ask people is, are you as ruthless as you can be with your time? It's a is, really good way to put it. And nobody ever says yes. Like even right now I could be no, I could do a more. little more ruthless with you. I could be like, I mean, like I'm totally comfortable going quote over our allotted time because it's like a great conversation and I'm enjoying it. And there's somebody coming to meet me, but he'll, he'll, he's cool. He'll wait. He'll a few wait. Minutes, like whatever. But I could be more ruthless. Like everybody has it within them to, to level up their, their yeah. discipline and almost militarism about their time. And so until you actually max out that, you, don't tell us what you don't have. Well, and, and I'll add to that. We will not work with a anybody inside. I will not coach you on money until you've answered for me the question, what do you want? And it cannot have dollar signs attached to it, right? And we set a why, we set a purpose to the financial freedom that we're going to create. And then we get to work toward it. And that's, that's very similar to what you're talking about. We have to be focused on what it is that we want, right? Do we, do we want to relax or do we want to get after it? Like, that's, I don't care which it is, but if you say you want success and you're not doing the things required to get there, then you don't really want it, right? right. And don't tell me, show me, right? Don't tell me, show me by your actions what you really want. And I could recount, I mean, it's easy to look at me now. I'm an owner of a multi-million dollar business and this is all well and I own all my time. And well, it's easy for Brad to say, I broke up, I, I grew up dirt poor on a third generation family farm. Like, I didn't have anything, you know, and, and I, I, I went through that investment period of a grind to create the time. And I, and I forego, I, I gave up a lot to get there. Right. Mm. I didn't, I, I'm married and I have six kids. I chose what I gave up, but I gave up, I make the joke, but it's only half joking that with every kid I had to give up a hobby. No. I don't resent my kids for it, but I did. It was true. Every time I had a kid, I had a new, a new set of time constraints to make a decision. And I grew up loving watching the NFL. But with my third kid, I've not watched other than probably two quarters of the Super Bowl in the last 10 years. I've watched a single game. 
And I'm not sad about it. But when I think about it, what do I want? Do I sit on the couch and watch football or hang out with my kids? I'd rather hang out with my kids, right? Or do I want to watch the Super Bowl or watch the NFL games or build my business? I'd rather yeah. build my business. If I'm going to choose two of those, I'm going to build my business and hang out with my kids, right? It's just, it's just, it's pretty simple when we really get clear about what do we want and what are the actions required to lead there. And we were joking about this offline. I want to say it on the air. Like people think they're coming into us to learn money strategies and tips. Yeah. And really all of we've done is wrap personal development in this wrapper, right? It's the peanut butter that I put on the pill for you to swallow of money. But it's really, we spend a lot of time talking about personal development. We set targets and we set goals. And when was the last time you had a clear objective inside your money, right? But we, every, everyone that we're coaching and working with has clear 10 year outcomes, 12 month objectives and 90 day targets. Until we set those, I cannot talk to you about products. I cannot talk to you about strategies. I can't talk to you about anything until I know what it is we're trying to build. The same would be in business coaching, right? How could you build a business without 90 day targets and without a one year objective and a three year vision and a 10 year goal? Like you can't. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's impossible. What's, what's interesting is, you know, it's, it's so tempting in a conversation like this to be like, Oh my gosh, it's such a cool coincidence. Like you guys talk about 90 days and, and talk about, you know, one year and five year and 10 year. And you guys talk about how, you know, you take the financial carrot, but the reality is you, you pull it apart and very quickly it becomes into the personal growth and the habits and the, the development required to become the person that will do the things that ultimately will get the result. Like what a cool coincidence. Cause I talk about that stuff too, but the reality is get a hundred really successful people in a room who've built their own businesses, who genuinely want to help people. I suspect we're all basically saying the same things and we're all this and it's back to, we're all using the same formulas. Exactly. So my yeah. business is different than your business and my investment outcomes are slightly different than yours, but we're all following the same formulas, right? But if you tried to give me advice and said, hey, Brad, you should build a personal development online business, that might not work for me, right? right? But if you say, hey, if you're going to build a business, you should figure out what it is that you want, who you're serving, how you're going to serve them to the highest level, and then set some targets around it. Okay, now I got a formula that I can use. And you should probably become a really badass, gritty SOB who does really, really hard things with discipline and consistency and says no to most of what the world says yes to and says yes to a few important things that most of the world is scared to say no to and do that for like 10 years and shut up and stop being so impatient. And it's funny, we say, <laughs> right. we, we say financial freedom in 10 years or less because that's exactly the same formula. Say no to 97% of everything you've ever been taught about money. Say yes to three things and do that for 10 years and then come back and tell me that you're not financially free because it's just too simple to not be. <sighs> what a great, exactly. what a great, a great t t uh, note to just let ring in the air. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, Brad, listen, this has been tremendous. I, uh, I appreciate it so much, both you and Ryan, you know, you're, you're doing the right things. You're saying the right things, but what people need and what I feel and observe is that you're, you're genuinely passionate about helping. I th and and it, frankly, one of the nice things about working with people that are financially free is you, you know, they're not doing it <laughs> to get your money. I don't need your money. Yeah, I'm good. at least I'm good. I they'll take money. it and they actually yep. believe they're worth it if they're providing value. Yep. But it's, there's always something more. And I get that from you and Ryan. It's, it's really awesome, yep. man. Yep. Um, so this how do people... Conversation, man. It is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, uh, I'm actually going to be up north. Well, I, I'm, I'm in St. George, so I, I'm oh. up your way frequently. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get to connect in person, which will be awesome. Absolutely. Um, but uh, for right now, can you share with the audience how they can get into your world and learn more about you personally and also what you do? Yep. The best way to do it is we've put together a, a what we call a five-day challenge, right? It's, it's meant to get the clarity that we've been talking about, where you are currently, what's not working, what's standing in the way, what you need to start focusing on and apply all of that to you and you're going to leave with those targets. So in five days, that seems very complex and heady of what we've talked about, but we've really taken our experience of building over a thousand individual game plans 
and we've we distilled it down into five days, 20 minutes at a time in a quick exercise to get you more clear than you've ever been on, on where you are and what your path to financial freedom looks like. So it's, like I said, it's, it's us coaching you through that five day. Uh, it's our five day challenge. So it's cashflowtactics.com forward slash challenge. Uh, don't be deceived that because it's free, that it's not valuable. We spent tens of thousands of dollars lots and lots of times creating this. And really it is the best way to just get in and get some results quickly to starting to understand what needs to change. That's awesome. Um, and we'll get that link in the description, wherever this cool. appears on the podcast and the show and all that. Um, Brad, this has been tremendous. I, um, I want to thank you for, for being a guest on Millionaire Secrets. I also want to let the audience know that we've put uh, ourselves a very valuable um, but also free <laughs> and not to be taken lightly just because it's free uh, yep. book called uh, the millionaire shortcut. Awesome. And that basically is kind of our position on what's the fastest way to become uh, a millionaire in the new economy. Probably very consistent Brad with what you teach because the reality is like you said, if you don't increase your production capacity, a lot of this stuff is kind of moot and we're going to show people how to quickly go get some initial, you know, cash wins so they can start to do this stuff. And we've, uh, we've actually put that on a special page for listeners of this episode at millionairesecrets.com slash Brad G. Sweet. So that we'll know that it came from this episode. Uh, make sure to grab that. Make sure to follow Brad. Make sure to check out his five-day challenge, which we'll put the link down below. And uh, Brad and the audience, I thank everyone for being a part of another great episode of Millionaire Secrets. Thank you for watching Millionaire Secrets. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you know whenever we release a new episode. Also, if you want to learn the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy, click the link in the description below to claim your free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut. And don't forget, Millionaire Secrets is available on all the major podcast platforms as well. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you can listen on the go. Thanks for watching.